Within the next three decades, somebody in the U.S. will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease every 33 seconds. So what can be done to slow that train down? Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. And it is a sad and somber fact that dementia cases are expected to triple over the next 30 years. So what can be done? What steps can you take today to help make sure that you stay on a healthier track? Today, we are going to be talking all about that. And as a matter of fact, there is a brand new study that was just published in the journal Neurology that looked at the connection between Alzheimer's disease and your diet. What is that connection there? Well, the research says one thing, but then if you look at the headlines splashed across everywhere right now, it says that diet doesn't matter. But does it though? Let's find out. Today, we are going to be joined by Dr. Neil Barnard. He is the author of Your Body in Balance and somebody well-steeped in Alzheimer's disease research. He's here to help answer those questions for us today. And if there's a question that you would like to ask Dr. Barnard, go ahead and post that in the comments or in the chat. We will get to as many as we possibly can here on the show today. You can also send them in on Twitter or Instagram anytime. I am at Chuck Carroll, WLC. And with that, we welcome Dr. Barnard to the exam room live. Sir, this is a great topic, an important topic. Topic, and I'm always excited to talk about that, especially when there's new research out there. Well, it's one of the things that is so much on people's minds. If you've looked at maybe what your grandparents went through or maybe what your parents have gone through, you think, make a list of all the things that I don't want to have hit me. And Alzheimer's disease is at the, the top of that list because when you get it, you lose everybody and everything that ever mattered to you. But the good news is there's a lot that we can do. But there's, as you were just saying, there's a lot of kind of noise in, in the media, and it's a little bit hard to, to separate that out. So that's what we'll do today. Yeah. So let's start with diet and this new study. The study comes out, and it be I believe this one was looking at one specific type of diet. Yet, as I said, the headlines, they read, diet doesn't matter. That's a pretty blanket statement. What exactly did this particular study find, though? Okay. This is a study, uh, actually a very well-respected study. It's from Malmo, Sweden. And they have been looking at diet and various kinds of diseases for a long period of time. This is called the, the Malmo Diet and Cancer Study, about 30,000 participants. So it's a good study. And they began back in the mid-1990s. They started tracking what people ate. And then up through 2014, they looked to see if there were any links between diet factors and whether people would succumb to Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. And exactly what you said is, is what the diet seem, or what the study seemed to show, which is, gee, it doesn't really matter very much what you eat. We're not really seeing very much signal here. But then you look into the fine print and you see the diets that they were testing. One was just what's a healthy diet in Sweden. And the other was a, sort of a modified Mediterranean diet. And that's where we got concerned because in both cases, the diets weren't really very different from what people were eating before, and they did not align with the diets that we already know to be associated with, with improved Alzheimer's uh, statistics. All right, so let's talk about what is included in that Mediterranean diet for people who aren't yet familiar with it. How does that compare to the healthier plant-based diet that we prescribe here on the show? Okay. Uh, the Mediterranean region is vast. It's all uh, Southern Europe, around the Middle East and up Northern Africa. So it's been sort of artificially defined for research purposes to mean moving toward plants, but not very far. So it's um, there, there is some use of vegetables and fruits and beans and grains and that kind of thing. Um, but with regard to meat, meat is not excluded. Red meat can be included. Processed meat can be included, but diminished. Uh, there's an emphasis on fish and some emphasis on poultry. Uh, dairy products are de-emphasized, but not excluded at all. Uh, olive oil is included, sometimes to a rather generous degree. Um, eggs, they might say maybe four per week, something like that. Um, and then to, to their credit, they encourage people to avoid processed, uh, heavily processed foods, have fruit for dessert instead of pudding. Those are kind of the, the, the main rules. So it's sort of a couple steps toward a plant-based diet while still including meat, dairy products, eggs, and, and fried foods and that kind of thing. 
And here's the thing. I had the opportunity to look at this uh, particular study here. And what jumped out at me is when you're talking about this modified Mediterranean diet that they're referring to in the study, as you said, there are some things on there that aren't necessarily going to be included on that healthy plant-based diet. So there are healthy allowances, as you said, for things like vegetable oils, particularly olive oil. But then there's also red and processed meat. Uh, that, that you can have on there. Butter, margarine, and cream were specifically cited as having their own allowance on this diet, as well as pastries and candy. So if you take those things out of the equation and you take the fish off the table, you take all the meat, the dairy off of the table, how much healthier is your diet going to be if you skew, skew exclusively toward that plant-based side? Well, dramatically. And, and in fact, Mediterranean diet researchers found this out. Now, let me give you a little bit of a backdrop. Uh, this was 1993. The Chicago Health and Aging Project uh, found, uh, going from that year through the next decade, that if they looked at the people who really were not eating the saturated fat, that's the bad fat that's in dairy and meat, their risk of developing Alzheimer's was cut to a half to a third of what uh, it would otherwise have been. Uh, to put it the other way, the people who were eating the dairy products and meat had two to three times higher risk of Alzheimer's. And then many other studies show the same thing, that if you eat more vegetables and fruits, you're gonna do better. So then people have looked at these um, sort of baby step studies where a person is just cutting down on dairy, cutting down on meat, do you get anywhere? And they're finding, not really. But I have to say, Chuck, there was an amazing study that, that many people are aware of called Predimed. It was done in Spain, more than 7,000 people, very well done study, and they found that a Mediterranean diet in this at-risk population didn't do anything with regard to reducing cardiovascular mortality. Um, but it did have just modest reductions if you combined all kinds of cardiac events and stroke and so forth. You could find some benefit, but just did you die of a heart attack or die of anything, really no effect at all. In the course of that study, Chuck, people, the, the researchers asked themselves exactly the question that you said, what if we go a step further? They looked within their participant population for those who really were following a more plant-based diet, who uh, uh, really going into vegetables and beans and, and plant-based foods and excluding the animal products. And suddenly the, the clouds parted. Within that population, they could show a dramatic reduction in not only cardiovascular mortality, but all-cause mortality. And what we're concluding is that a Mediterranean diet sounds indulgent, sounds fun, sounds nice, sounds like I'll be driving down the coast of Tuscany toward a, you know, a sunset dinner with a glass of wine, swell. Um, but if people only use that as to make a few choices uh, th that are slightly different from what they were doing before, their health isn't going to be much different from what it would otherwise have been. But if you use that as a signal to go, all right, let me really jump into plants in a big way, that's when the benefits really start to arrive. And uh, re remind me, uh, the, the Mediterranean diet, again, that's uh, really touted specifically as being a cardiovascularly healthy diet. That's the heart healthy diet. Is that what it's purported to be primarily? The, the, yes. Um, and in the Predimed study that I mentioned, it, at first it was pretty disappointing because it didn't affect cardiovascular deaths. It didn't affect total deaths. But what it did do and what people have credited with is that it led to about a 30% reduction in this composite score that mixed, did you have a heart attack? Did you have a stroke? Did you die? If you put all those things together, they could show that about three out of 10 of those would be prevented. The other seven out of 10 weren't, but that 30% reduction was enough to, to convince people that it's a move in the right direction. And I think it is generally better than what people were eating before. But if you could compare that to say, a completely low fat vegan diet, I mean, they're just day and night difference, that, that getting the animal products out of your life completely is dramatically more effective than having little bits here and there. You've used the, the, the terminology low fat a couple of times now. Is that one of the primarily um, driving factors in terms of diet and dementia risk? Um, I don't think it's the whole thing. I think it's part of it. Um, when people have a high fat diet, even if it's good fats, they have trouble losing weight and they have trouble getting their diabetes to go away. And overweight is one of the drivers for Alzheimer's disease. But apart from the low fat, when a person just goes vegan, they have done a great thing. There is no more beef or chicken in their diet. There's no more fish. And that means that most of the saturated fat is gone. There's no more dairy in their diet. Dairy is the biggest source of saturated fat. So even if a person 
is having some vegetable oils in their diet, but the animal products are gone, they have done a really good thing uh, by eliminating the saturated fat because that was in the Chicago study, what turned out to be one of the number one determiners of Alzheimer's risk to make it short and sweet. You get the, the bad fat out of your diet, your risk of developing Alzheimer's goes way, way down if your numbers are like those that we're seeing in these research studies. Let's go ahead and open up the doctor's mailbag right now and take a question from Addison, who's like, well, now hold him, hold up a minute. I heard that the fish, which is obviously included in a Mediterranean diet, the fat that's found in fish is a healthy fat. So how does that compare to the fat that's found naturally in plant foods? Well, the problem with it is that all fats are mixtures. So it's true that, say, salmon has um, more uh, omega-3 than uh, you might find in beef. But overall, there's a lot of fat in that salmon. It's about 40% fat. If it's a Chinook salmon, it's over 50% fat. That's why people buy it, because it's a fatty fish. And they imagine that that's good fat. Most of the fat in salmon and most of the fat in any fish is not omega-3. And in fact, if you take that Chinook salmon, send it to a laboratory, they're going to tell you it has about the same saturated fat content and the same cholesterol content as roast beef. It just happens to be also some omega-3 mixed in with it. So it is, it is nothing like vegetables or beans or something like that. If a person goes to a plant-based diet, the omega-3 sources, some of them are really quite subtle and surprising. You take green leafy vegetables, spinach or broccoli or asparagus or something, you wouldn't think of them as having any fat. They do. They have maybe six, seven, eight percent of their calories are fat. And about half of those are from omega-3. So it's um, really quite surprising that these good fats are just waiting for you to come and pick them up. All right, let's take a question here for kind of the uh, the uninitiated into the plant-based world. Maybe somebody's uh, watching us here for the first time or listening to the podcast for the very first time today. And they're like, well, now, wait a minute here. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of fats out there. You've got saturated fat, you've got trans fats, and then you've got these natural fats that you're talking about that are pl uh, found in plant foods. Can you tell us a little bit about the difference between those different types of fats, Dr. Barnard? Yeah. Um, we don't need to get a PhD in fats. I got to tell you. So I, I, <laughs> let, let, let me try to, <laughs> try to keep it simple. Um, ho however, if you did, the, the thing they would tell you on day one is that there are only two fats that your body needs. Bacon grease is not one of them. You know, the, the grease that, that drips out of a donut or chicken wings, that's not one of them either. Um, there are two fats that you do need. They're called alpha linolenic acid and alpha linoleic acid. And where do you find them? You find them in plants. Um, the alpha linolenic acid, this will not be on the test, but it's, it's an omega-3 that when you consume it, whether you get it in greens or your chia seeds or whatever it may be, your body will take that and can make the other omega-3s out of it. So there's no need for animal fat of any, of, at all. There is zero requirement for saturated fat. Now, monounsaturated fat, that's what's mostly in olive oil, also in avocado oil. There's not a requirement for that either. Um, although on the good hand, it's much better than the fat that's in cheese or meat. It's not so likely to make your cholesterol go up. But all fats, here's the reason that, that you're gonna hear me say low fat. All fats are pretty dense in calories. So if a person says, I'm trying to lose some weight. If I could do that, I might get rid of my diabetes or maybe I'd feel better. Um, all fats contribute uh, a lot of calories, nine calories in every single gram. So we're gonna keep it low fat and the fats you're getting are hopefully those that are natural to plants, giving you omega-3 from the source that nature thought you were going to take advantage of. Yeah, and I just want to take a second here to put in a plug uh, for uh, a really phenomenal guacamole recipe that's on our website. If you click on the Alzheimer's page there, and I'll also include, uh, include a link to it in the show description here or in the episode notes. It's a guacamole where if you add chickpeas to it, uh, you can really cut down on the amount of fat because essentially the chickpeas are going to take over uh, some of the work that the avocado would be doing. Just as creamy, just as flavorful uh, with uh, less fat. And so you could even say, well, that's a plant fat. You know, it comes from avocado. But as you were just saying, you know, when it comes to just caloric density here, you know, it's all the same. So that's a, that's a pretty good recipe, in my opinion. And there are little steps that you can take to really help reduce that fat. And in this case, then also bring your risk for Alzheimer's and all of these other chronic diseases right on down. Have you had that guacamole, by the way, just as an it, aside? 
Absolutely delicious. People have done this with chickpeas. They've done it with garden peas. And exactly what you said is, is what happens is that it ups the protein content. It really cuts the fat content, but the taste is, is all there. And so it, what you said is exactly right. The avocado fat is a healthier type of fat, but there is just so much of it. That avocado is the gift that keeps on giving. And so <laughs> if you can, and it's so addicting, you know, it, uh, it, it's really hard for people to stop eating it and slather it on everything they eat. So if you've got a healthier version, you're, you're way ahead. I'm telling you, guacamole is just like peanut butter. It's like the mm. serving size is two tablespoons, but good luck limiting yourself to that, my friend. Good right. luck. Um, the other thing that pops up on the website when you go to uh, our Alzheimer's page is the importance of vitamin E. What is the connection there between Alzheimer's risk? Vitamin E is an antioxidant. And what we believe with Alzheimer's disease is that free radicals are coursing around through your blood, getting into your brain, and they're like sparks. They're just burning through the connections between neurons and you need antioxidants to knock them out. People are familiar with beta carotene or the lycopene that's in a tomato, gives it the red color. Vitamin C also. Um, but vitamin E is an antioxidant. And in the Chicago study that I mentioned earlier, it was amazing. They looked at some people who ate a little bit more vitamin E compared to, to people who ate a little bit less. The people who had a little bit more vitamin E cut their Alzheimer's risk by half. That is completely separate from the benefit you get from avoiding saturated fat. So you're starting to add these things together. Okay, I avoid the saturated fat. I make sure I get some vitamin E. Um, but big, big caution here, Chuck. Uh, do not go to the health food store and get vitamin E there and take a pill of vitamin E every day. Because in nature, there are eight different forms of vitamin E. At the health food store, in that bottle, there might be one, there might be two. And if you take that one or two, uh, the, the one or two types of vitamin E, they can suppress the absorption of the other forms of vitamin E. Don't get it out of a pill. Get it out of nature. And nature-packed vitamin E in green leafy vegetables, but much more in nuts and seeds. So we're back to the nuts. Um, and you and I have talked about this before. How do I get the benefit without just going crazy with it? And about uh, one small handful a day will give you a good five milligrams of vitamin E, and that gets you a long way toward the amount that's going to protect you. Yeah, quick plug for the last episode that you and I did together, that last Q&A, all about nuts. Uh, there are so many questions in there. So absolutely, if nuts are a concern of yours in your diet, making sure that you're getting the right amount, not overdoing it, the healthiest kind of nut, all kinds of things in there are in that last episode. So go ahead and check that out. Um, here's the thing, Dr. Barnard, you and I have been talking now for the last 15 or so minutes, 17 minutes, uh, about the connection between diet and Alzheimer's disease. And yet with this study that we're talking about, this latest one, you look at the headlines and they really did. They, honest to goodness, said diet doesn't matter for Alzheimer's risk. And it seems like based off of what you and I are talking about here today, nothing could be further from the truth. Diet makes a huge difference and not only for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and researchers have also looked at the earlier phases of dementia. One is called mild cognitive impairment. This means you're still yourself, but words are slipping out of your memory. You can't remember a name, uh, words. Um, you might still drive. You might still manage your checkbook, but you know that your memory is not so hot. And for some people, it stays that way and it doesn't get worse. And you just think, well, I'm, I'm up in years. I'm having some trouble. For others, this is a step toward Alzheimer's and they get worse. Researchers have found that the same things that seem to protect Alzheimer's, against Alzheimer's also protect against mild cognitive dysfunction. And so mild cognitive impairment. So uh, when researchers have looked at people's saturated fat intake, which I mentioned is a real key for Alzheimer's, it also seems to the extent that people avoid Alzheimer, uh, avoid saturated fat, it can reduce the risk of these earlier stages too. Even if you carry the genes that would predispose you to Alzheimer's, there's a gene, the APOE epsilon 4 allele. Yeah, this will not be on the test either, but you got it from both parents. Your risk of Alzheimer's is 10 to 15 times higher. So people have viewed it as, I'm, I'm just condemned. You can't change your genes, but you can change what's on your plate. And when people avoid the saturated fat and make these other changes, their risk of developing the old age memory problems goes way, way down, just like the people who don't have the genes. I don't know that it's um, perfect. 
I think some people may still get it. We don't know what happens after, say, 25 years, 30 years. But what we do know is all the indications are that, that diet matters hugely. And in some cases, uh, MCI, mild cognitive impairment, that is reversible. I believe I've, we've talked about, even on this show, uh, studies that point to that direction. Is that correct? Well, people have looked in two ways. Um, one is uh, the use of certain foods like anthocyanin-rich foods. Those are the, the blueberries, grapes, that purplish color, that's anthocyanin. And a number of these studies have shown that you bring in uh, patients who are having trouble with their memory, give them about a cup of, say, grape juice, just straight off the shelf. Uh, give it to them in the morning, give one at night. And after about a three month period, you see that retention is better, memory is noticeably better. People have all do also done this with blueberries. And then the other area is with exercise. Quite apart from what you eat, uh, if you're a couch potato, that seems to not work so well. But when people lace up their sneakers, even if you're not running a marathon, the amount that has been shown to be effective for reversing brain shrinkage and reversing this mild cognitive uh, impairment that some people are getting into is a 40 minute brisk walk three times a week. So a brisk walk means you're walking fast enough so that's not a trudge. You, you can feel it, that your heart's beating a little bit faster. Your, your, your breathing is a little bit faster, but it is not so fast that you cannot speak. So 40 minute brisk walk three times a week. If you're not up to that, start with 10, go 10 minutes, three times a week. Then the next week, go 15. The next week, go 20 minutes, three times a week. You work over up to 40. That's the amount that in research studies has been shown to help. If you want to do more, go for it. You can, you can certainly do more. Random question for you. I'm not sure that there's even been research on this, but does it matter if the person's walking on a treadmill or is there something to be said for being outside if you can? And maybe there's that little bit of an extra boost just because of that nature stimulation that you get. My best guess is it doesn't matter. And the reason I'm saying that is not from Alzheimer's, but we saw this with depression studies, that exercise is very, it's an effective antidepressant. And people thought, well, that's because you're in a Zumba class. <laughs> you know, you're hearing the music. Um, you're with friends. You're having a blast. You know, And if you do that every day, you're just going to feel better. So researchers did the same study, but they had people like sit in their, li in their living room. They put a, a treadmill there and they did the exercise by themselves. And they had the same effect. So there's something about getting the heart and the, the, the lungs working that has an antidepressant effect. So from that, we are extrapolating that the exercise benefits for cognitive function might also be there um, regardless of whether you're with other people. That said, go with other people for a couple of reasons that, that you're, going to be, you're going to be with other folks. Um, they are going to be the ones who, when your motivation is flagging, they're going to say, come on, I want to walk with you. Um, and you're there with, you know, with the light and the, um, the nice surroundings, and it just makes it uh, something you don't want to miss. Let's take a question here from Noor. Uh, she's wondering how important is it in your estimation, Dr. Barnard, uh, how important is diet compared to sleep and exercise when it comes to Alzheimer's prevention? They both matter enormously. Um, first of all, if you haven't slept um, and you're just ragged out the next day, you're going to eat anything just to get through the day. And you're, you're, uh, Motivation to, to take care of yourself just really flags. You're going to think, well, you're going to think I'll do better later on. So, so sleep is important in that way. But sleep is also important in another way. Sleep is when your body, your, your brain shuts down making beta amyloid. These are the things that end up in plaques in the brain. If you stay up all night, your brain just keeps making the beta amyloid. When you knock off to sleep, it slows down. Finally, sleep is when your body says, thank you. You don't have a lot of incoming stimulation. Your brain uses that time to sort of store away the words that you've learned, the new things you've learned, so that you can find them tomorrow. Um, the beginning of sleep, there's a phase called slow wave sleep. Gets that name because we attach EEG leads to people's scalp, and you can see the waves slowing down when people lose consciousness in, in sleep. And that's when the brain says, great, I've got a desk full of papers before you wake up, I'm going to make sure everything is in a drawer so you can find it tomorrow. So then the next day, your memory for things that happened the previous day is organized. One last thing. Toward morning, starting 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, dreams become uh, more predominant in sleep. We see uh, rapid eye movement sleep as opposed to slow wave sleep earlier. It's now rapid eye movement. When you are dreaming, you're doing two things. Your brain is consolidating 
physical skills like playing tennis or playing the guitar or the piano or whatever, um, but also integrating emotional things. And you'll find that your dreams often have a little bit of an emotional content to them. That's your brain trying to make sense of things. So if you stayed up all night because you were an intern in the hospital or whatever the case may be, and you're just chronically sleep deprived, your memory will flag and your emotional control will not be what it or ordinarily would be. So the answer, get some sleep and eat well. A healthy diet helps you sleep. Good sleep helps you to eat well. How much of that is restorable in the sleep deprived, your your emotional well-being and uh, your energy and, you know, just your memory overall? If somebody's been sleep deprived for years and then they really put on a focus of getting at least eight hours a day, will they start to see some improvements? Yeah, you, you sure will. And um, I have to say, I noticed this myself and it was a rather frightening thing. I was in my late late 20s and around 30. And, and as an intern, I was working the um, I don't know how many hours per week it was. It was an, uh, every third night I was, I would not only work today, but I would work all night and all the next day. And then the next day was a normal day. And then you do the same thing again. So you're, you're losing sleep. Every third night is gone. And I noticed that I could do this for a while, but as time went on, I found I had to write everything down carefully because my, my short-term memory just was not very good. And, uh, it, 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 it then when I would say go on vacation, and be able to sleep every night. It took three or four or five days before I felt back to my normal self. So extrapolating from that for people who have been doing this for years, um, sometimes they've also kind of lapsed into unfortunate things. They're propping themselves up with just lots of caffeine or, or sometimes worse things than that. And they're, they're really not doing well, but it's, it's never too late to get your diet back together. It's never too late to get your sleep habits back together. Yeah, and would you believe I was actually just looking at a, a study that came out specifically looking at sleep earlier today. This is a brand new study. It showed that people who are over the age of 50 and get uh, less than five hours a night are at higher risk of having not just one chronic disease, but at least two. So we're talking about things not just like Alzheimer's, uh, but heart disease, cancer, diabetes, all of those conditions that you really have zero interest in having. And so, as you said, you know, making sure that you get those eight hours so your brain can go ahead and do that housekeeping at night while you're asleep, you know, really brings down that risk. So you're talking about two conditions you can significantly drop your risk for. That's pretty substantial. Yeah. And not only that, when a person is getting that little sleep, what are they doing? And my rule of thumb is 10 o'clock, go to sleep. It's a really good habit to get into. It's hard to do. I mean, there's great stuff on TV. There are always things to be done, to, to be done. But if at 10 o'clock you can knock off to sleep, not only will your brain get the, the sleep that it needs, that's so restorative, but also if you're unconscious, you can't go to the refrigerator. So that's a big plus too. You know, when a person stays up till 2.30 in the morning, you know, half that time, they're sticking their head in the fridge, seeing what is to eat. And so, um, so it's not just the fact that sleep is good, but sleep also prevents you from doing bad things to your diet. Absolutely. And uh, one of the final points that I want to make before we broaden things up, broaden up our discussion today and include other things was I pulled some uh, estimates on the costs that are associated with treating Alzheimer's and the Alzheimer's Association actually broke it down, I thought, magnificently. Um, they, they cited a study that found that in the last five years of life, the cost for a person with dementia on average totaled more than $287,000. Now, mind you, this was actually back in 2010 that these numbers are pulled from. So you account for inflation today. I'm sure that it's much higher. And that, so that 287,000, Dr. Barnard, that's compared to 175,000 for somebody who has heart disease and 173,000 for someone with cancer. So Alzheimer's, not just a very costly condition in terms of your mind, but also in terms of draining the savings that you've worked a lifetime to accrue as you've been working so hard. Um, that is, I mean, the cost of treatment there is just mind-blowingly astronomically high. Yeah, well, sure, a exactly. And it makes complete sense because the people do have physical problems as well. But when a person has severe dementia, you're also needing to have care for just what we call the activities of daily living. A person with heart disease or cancer can typically go to the bathroom. They can make their breakfast and so forth. But when a person's got Alzheimer's disease, all these other things get built into the nursing care um, and falls and all kinds of other problems are so much more challenging. That's why we're looking at things that we can do to make sure that this doesn't happen to the extent that we can.
And the final bow on this, uh, the headlines, Dr. Barner, as I said, they say diet doesn't matter for Alzheimer's risk. Your retort to that is? Well, now, sometimes the media is looking for something contrary. So if there's been a spate of studies <laughs> saying that something works, uh, the editor wants to say, well, let's, let's zing them with something that shows it doesn't work, and that's clickbait. I don't know if that's what's going on here. That's part of it. The other not so good motivation is sometimes people have something to sell. So there is somebody who's got some new pill or a new supplement, and they are unfortunately seeding literature trying to say, these things don't work. Let me show you what I can sell you that does. I'm not saying that was what was happening with these reports, but unfortunately we have seen exactly those motivations that have skewed medical reporting over the years. And hopefully as time goes on, people are being a little bit more honest. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I can tell you as a former journalist, clickbait is absolutely 100% part of the problem because the journalists uh, are graded on how many views their stories get. Um, but also, you know, it comes down to, I think a lot of times, Dr. Barnard, journalists don't quite know how to interpret this data and dig a little bit deeper. And that's why you get these lazy headlines like diet doesn't matter as well. So yeah, it gets clicks, but it's also you know, I, I hate to use the term ignorance because that sounds harsh on the journalist standpoint, but in a lot of cases, that's also exactly what's going on here. So I think a little coaching up in that direction can go a long way. But that, my friend, is a story for another day. We have a few minutes left here, so let's go ahead and open up that doctor's mailbag and get a couple of other questions that have been sitting in there and get some answers for it. A little bit of everything here. So we've got a hodgepodge here. Um, let's take a hard turn and just take a fun question from Dylan. Why not? Uh, Dylan is one wondering whether there is any risk whatsoever to eating too many tomatoes. Any risk from eating too many tomatoes? What a wonderful question. Um, you know, tomatoes used to be thought of just something to slice up and put on your salad. But Harvard researchers probably 20 years ago uh, showed everybody that they were really important for health. What they were looking at was the red color in the tomato, lycopene. It's also in watermelon, pink grapefruit. Lycopene is a powerful antioxidant cousin of beta carotene that makes carrots orange. It's just chemically slightly different. And now it's red. And researchers showed that men who eat the most lycopene have the lowest risk of prostate cancer. There is something about tomatoes that will greatly reduce the, the prostate cancer risk. And the beauty of it was it didn't matter how you ate them. In fact, if you took a, a fresh organic tomato, that's good. But if you cooked it, that would even break out some of the lycopene even more. And it even counted if it was in salsa, taco sauce, or ketchup. You get that, yes, I'm not making this up. Uh, the lycopene works in all of those ways. So people have been adding it to their foods. And is there any risk of getting too much? Nope, you're fine. That's a big old check for the old condiments right mm -hmm. there. Okay, ketchup <laughs> lovers rejoice. Uh, Peter, is meat unhealthier than ultra-processed food? Well, meat is an ultra processed food. I know that sounds a little bit of a funny thing to say, but meat started out life as a feed grain, uh, corn or soybeans or grass. And a big machine came up called a cow and took that grass and started swallowing it. And from this started making cholesterol and making saturated fat and making all kinds of things just like a factory could do, but this factory is a living, breathing animal. And then at some point, a while later, somebody had the bad judgment to take that cow and hang him up by his leg and sl uh, slice, slit his throat and eat the, the flesh or sell it at Safeway. And what you are now eating is the mo one of the most highly processed foods there is because it started out as a grain and now it's uh, muscle tissue or it's a dairy product or something like that. And it's very dangerous. It's much more dangerous than say a processed grain like spaghetti or something like that because meat has all the things you don't want, cholesterol, saturated fat, E. coli, salmonella, uh, various chemicals that are often added. Uh, but even when they're not, it's also lacking the things that your body really needs. It doesn't have any fiber. It doesn't have any complex carbohydrate. It doesn't have vitamin C. So yeah, meat is, if you're getting the meat off your diet, uh, out of your diet, and you do not, no other change, you've made a really big improvement in your diet. Oh, man, the exam roomies are just cracking me up today. So we had the question about eating too many tomatoes. Ian now is wondering whether it's possible to eat too many beans. Now, what are you people doing here? Um, they, they, there are lots of, you know, there are like 25 aisles in the grocery store. Okay, you don't have to just stay in the tomato <laughs> aisle. I mean, it, there's great stuff there, but you can have other things. And you don't have to stay in the bean aisle. Now, if you do, that's okay. But no, there's no risk to having uh, too many beans. Beans are fine. 
Um, now beans are loaded with fiber. They're extremely, they're kind of the fiber champion. And so that's why they cause a little bit of gassiness for some people. So if you kind of overdo it with beans, theoretically that could occur, but most people kind of adapt over time. And if they're well cooked, they're going to be a okay. So no beans are your friend. All right. Well, I think, you know, Ian may not like beans because he's got a follow-up question to that. And you, you know, you just mentioned fiber in beans and obviously fiber fills you up, but now Ian is also wondering whether you have any advice for somebody who's still hungry after eating dinner. So I'm assuming at this point, Ian doesn't have many beans at all on his plate. Oh, you're still hungry after dinner. We, um, I guess we should look at the dinner, make sure that there was an adequate portion, but the, the four groups that are going to go into your dinner in a healthy dinner, Beans are one. The whole legume group is one, beans, peas, lentils. And then grains are another, whether that's rice or bread or pasta or corn, um, corn tortillas, whatever. So I got my beans, I've got grains, vegetables, fruits, and those foods are high in fiber to fill you up. They've got healthy, complex carbs to nourish your body and give you energy. So if you're still hungry after dinner, go back and have another portion. Those are healthy foods. All right. Uh, let's grab a few more here. i see if we can do these in rapid succession. Nicole, this is an interesting one. You and I, a couple of years ago, did a pretty good uh, show on this uh, for a full half hour, I think. Uh, but let's get the, the broad strokes here. Nicole is wondering whether eating for your blood type actually matters. Uh, real quick. No, doesn't matter at all. Um, the old idea was, and, and it's true, that people with type O blood, which is the most common kind, have a little bit less risk of cardiovascular disease for whatever reason compared to people with type A. People with type A are at higher risk for cardiovascular disease. People with type, people with type O are lower. Um, so some people thought, well, I'm type O. I have a little bit risk of less risk of having a heart attack. I should eat steak. And some well-meaning but ill-informed authors took them up on that and said, if you're type O, eat steak, eat burgers. And if you're type A, you better be a vegan. Um, our team actually did a study where we looked at different blood types and what we found is that a plant-based diet is far and away the best for every blood type. And a meat-based diet is far and away the worst for every blood type. So no, blood type in that respect does not matter. All right. And now Marge here is like, gentlemen, you have me convinced I'm switching to a low flat, a low fat plant-based diet. Problem is though, Marge also says that she loves her some cheese. How often have you heard this? So she's wondering what she can eat in place of cheese. She's heard that some of the non-dairy options that are sold in stores are still really high in fat and in oil and nuts and all kinds of things that she probably wants to take out of her diet if she's trying to keep it lower in fat. Yeah, uh, you, you said uh, what, exactly what you said is really important. Look at the labels. If it's a, a, a vegan cheese that's made with coconut oil, don't buy it. Um, it will raise your cholesterol. And frankly, the, the probably your, your best secret weapon is nutritional yeast. I don't know if you've ever used it, but they sell it at the health food store. Uh, sometimes it's in the supplement aisle, but, but if you ask the, the person who's running the store, they, they know where it is. And you take this nice powder, nutritional yeast, not, it's not brewer's yeast or baker's yeast, nutritional yeast, spread it on your pizza or on your spaghetti. It adds a cheesy flavor, saturated fat, zero, cholesterol, zero. And it's really, really tasty. And you'll find that it, it'll change your life. All right. And the final question today comes to us from C and D husband and wife couple. So the wife here is actually who's writing in and she wants to know how thin is too thin. She says her husband is 5'10 and weighs less than 150 pounds. Oh, well, well, first of all, good on you because you're worried about your husband. And you're going to take good care of him. That's, that's, that's a good thing. Um, when couples switch their diets together, that that's the best thing of all. So good on you for that. But if he weighs 150 pounds and he's 5'10", that is smack in the middle of the healthy weight range. And, and by the way, um, you can see this. Go online um, and Google BMI calculator. That's body mass index calculator. Your body mass index is a, is a way to, to see if your weight is in more or less the healthy range. It's not perfect, but it's about as good as we get. And for a man who's about 5'10", or anybody who's 5'10", and weighs about 150 pounds, the BMI is going to come in at probably around between 21, 22, which is great. Um, a healthy body mass index is anywhere between 18 and a half to 25. So your husband is doing great. But, but now people will tell him he's too thin. Why? Because as time has gone on, everybody else is getting heavy. 
And so he may be the slimmest person on the airplane or the slimmest person in the restaurant because he's normal weight and they've all got weight they'd like to lose. So no, he does not need to do anything to, to gain weight or anything like that. He is doing great. And he's lucky to have you looking out for him. Yeah, you said between 21 and 22. I actually crunched those numbers while you were uh, giving your answer there. It is 21.5 on the nose. Oh, so, there you I go. Mean, there it is. I mean, right smack dab in the middle of that healthy range. And, you know, one of these days, Dr. Barnard, I would love to do a show where we talk about, you know, how one weighs um, the idea of not body shaming anybody or fat shaming anybody, but also not pulling the wool over your eyes either that, you know, a lot of these high fat fun foods that we're kind of celebrating here are really detrimental to your health. That is a tight rope to walk. Um, and one, honestly, that when I was still overweight, you know, I was wrestling with as well. And so it's an interesting time that we're living in. It really, really is. It is. And, and I, I, th I think what you said is exactly right. People who are dealing with excess weight have for many years really been, been made to feel ashamed of themselves. And, and I think everybody's kind of been there with this, where people have, have used that as a, sometimes as a reason to, to, to sometimes make people feel bad um, and to be kind of mean about these things. And we realize that's, that's a mistake. But the thing not to do is we don't want to disempower people by saying, uh, weight isn't something that you should even think about, or it's not something that you can help yourself or, 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 it, whatever. I, I think it's important for people to know how weight affects health, ways that you can deal with that to, to take uh, in hand the best health uh, that you want to get to. And so if, if people are looking for healthy ways to lose weight, it's good for people to have that information. It's also important to help people to avoid really unhealthy ways to lose weight. There are so many of those. And to, to help people to steer clear of those and to be able to set a path that gets them to where they really want to be and to help their kids to live the best life they can. Those are real, real gifts. And, and that's, I think, what our job is. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the, the last thing I'll say about that for right now is that, you know, when it comes to losing weight, you're not just losing pounds on the scale, which is, it's great. It's always fun to see that, that number come down, but you are, when you're doing it in a healthy manner, losing such a, a high amount of that risk for everything that we've been talking about here on the show today and for five years now. So Alzheimer's disease, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, I mean, on and on and on and on, all of these chronic conditions that so many of us have in this country and around the world, when you're losing weight, your risk for those things comes down and down and down and down. So yeah, buying a smaller pair of pants is always fun, but what's more fun to me is knowing that, hey, I'm gonna be around to enjoy that smaller pair of pants for many, many, many years to come. So um, lots lots that we could get into there, my friend, a whole yeah. heck of a lot. You said it. And the answer is really to, to give people tools so that they can reach the best of health in a, in a really good and, and healthful way. All right. If we didn't get to your question today, my friends, have no fear. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. So go ahead. Keep on posting those in the comment or in the chat. You can also send them to me anytime on demand, Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Chuck Carroll, WLC. And today's episode of The Exam Room Live has been powered by the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund. You know, the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund supports organizations like the Physicians Committee that carry on Greg's love for animals by promoting plant-based health and working to end animal abuse while emphasizing emphasizing programs that promote systemic change and also benefit people. And you can visit them online right now at GregoryWriterFund.org. That's Gregory Writer, spelled R-E-I-T-E-R, fund.org. And Allison Mahoney and everybody there, thank you as always for your continued support. We could not do this show without your support. So thank you all very much. And as always, Dr. Barnard, I know you're as big of a fan as uh, of the Writer Fund as I am. Absolutely. I want to say a huge thank you to Allison for really carrying on Greg's wonderful, kind spirit, uh, doing this in such a beautiful way. So thank you for that. And if you haven't already subscribed to the Exam Room Podcast by the Physicians Committee, be sure to do that on Apple Podcast or on Spotify, wherever it is that you get your shows. And when you do that, please leave a five-star rating. And we've just started something brand new called the Five Star Health Success. So when you leave that five-star rating in your review, talk about how this show has helped to improve your own health. We would love to be able to share your story on the podcast. So go ahead and do that right now on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever it is that you get your shows. For today, my friends, that is all the time that we have. Dr. Barnard, thank you so very much for your time and your wisdom as always, my friend. Thank you, Chuck.
and to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen. Thank you as always. And to you exam roomies, thank you for all of your wonderful questions and making the show as much fun and as inspirational and as hopeful and filled with knowledge as it possibly could be. Thank you all so very much for tuning in today. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again soon, but until then, keep it plant-based.